What a blessing to be able to, and that's really what it is, to be able to serve the Lord in that way and to serve our community. Uh, we invite you next year, be looking forward to it. Actually be planning, stretching would maybe be a good thing now, getting in shape for it, and then come ready to serve your community on mission because that's really what this is. This is our mission field. We don't have to go to, to Africa, to Russia, to anywhere. We, we have plenty of work to do right here. And so I encourage you to be doing that about the week, about the month, about your days that the Lord gives you the honor to do that. Would you turn with me, please, to 2 Corinthians? And the title of this morning's ser- uh, sermon is going to be Repentance is God's Grace. Repentance is God's Grace. We're going to talk about repentance a great deal this morning. So I encourage you to be with me right there in 2 Corinthians, chapter 7, verses 10, sorry, verses 8 through 10. Still hear some turning in those wonderful pages. That's a, that's a great thing. We love that. We'll take the time. Turning. All right, read with me if you would. Follow along with me as I read. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 10. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, for I perceived that that same epistle made you sorry, though only for a little while. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss for, for us in nothing. Verse 10, for godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. For observing this very thing, that your sorrow in a godly manner, what diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourself, what, in, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication, in all things you were proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Would you pray with me, please? Fathers, we have uh, seen how you're allowing us to be a part of your service and your ministry and your mission here in this, in this county, in this city, in this state, in this nation. Father, we praise you for that. We give you the glory, as Sarah said, we give you the glory that only you deserve for everything we were able to accomplish. Father, we pray that this morning, as we are here with your word opened on our laps before our eyes and in our hearts and heads and ears, Lord, that you would uh, speak to us through it. Father, teach us like never before. Teach us through your spirit, through your word, like never before, what you desire of our lives. Father, and as you show it, convict us. And as you convict us, change us. Father, that we could live a life that would honor you and glorify you, a Christ-like life, that would not be disguised or be uh, confused with anything that's in us, but it is only because of you. Father, open your word to us this morning and speak through it. It is in your Son's name we pray. Amen. As you all know, these last few days, as you've seen, even in this video, it it was our grow weekend. This is our grow time. It's two days of full steam of head. I mean, just nonstop, hit it hard, mission work to our local neighbors and friends right here among you, people you know, people you shop with, people you work with, people you, I hope, love and will even love more in the future. It was great fun. It was great fellowship. Even beyond that was great fruitfulness. And the fruitfulness we won't even know of. In today, I mean, I, I know that just working shoulder to shoulder with, with my brothers and sisters in Christ was enough. That was it. That was wonderful. Just to get to know them better, to, to see them uh, suffer a little bit, and to be hungry or thirsty or tired or, or ham, slam their hand with a hammer, whatever it is. Just to get to experience that together is, is a great thing. Uh, there is no greater feeling, as all of you can attest, whether you were a part of Grow or not, there's no greater feeling than helping someone. Helping someone that, that's a part of your family and your neighbors is even the best because it's right here, it's close. If I were to ask you what would be some of the best things you could do for your neighbors, for your friends, if you were to list them out, you might say uh, feeding the hungry. That's a great thing to do. Giving a cup of water to a thirsty soul is a, is a great thing to do. Giving a, a coat in the winter to a cold back, maybe a listening ear to a hurting heart, or kind words spoken to a broken spirit. All these things are loving things to do, caring, things we should do. We're often asked at the GROW program, I know Sarah gets it quite a bit, why do you do that? What, what is the purpose? What's the reason? Why do you guys do this thing called GROW? Is it to help out our local families and our community? Yes. 
but. Is it to show how generous and loving and kind Christians are, especially Christians in Main Street Baptist Church? Yes, but. The greatest thing, the, the one thing we need, and over the years, the one thing we try to do most, I know Scott and Sarah, it's on their heart, is to share the love of Christ. To share the love of Christ. And there is no better way to do this than to share about the relationship of Christ. Not just to, to feed, not just to, to paint, not just to do all these things, but to share the gospel. To share the truth of who God is. To share the good news is the greatest thing we could ever give our neighbors, our friends, our family, even ourselves. It's the gospel. It's the first priority, the most important thing we do. And the reason we do all of that is to share the gospel. It's not a, it's not a hook. It's not a catch. It's not a bait and switch. It's the purpose. The reason you come to church, the reason you live, the reason you breathe as a Christian should be to share the gospel. Everything else just works towards that point. Everything this church does should bring him glory. Everything you as a follower of Christ do must be to bring him glory. The gospel is his love story to us. Us sinners, us, us, us creation that is not worthy of it. If you honestly can answer that, if you honestly look at your own life, you should answer that in that way. We're not worthy of his love. We're not worthy. The gospel is a conviction of sin that produces repentance. And that's what I want to talk to you this morning about. The gospel produces repentance. We could paint every house in the state. We could, pe- we could feed every hungry mouth. We could give a drink to every thirsty soul. But if and when they die without repentance, they would stand at judgment and be cast into hell. Envision that. You paint their house, you feed them, you, you give them drink, you give them clothing, but you don't give them the gospel. You do them no good. You've wasted the chance. They stand before God on judgment day, guilty of sin like we all are, and they're judged to hell. The reason we do these things is for the gospel. It's for the good news. Conviction of sin is grace. Do you see it that way? No, not always. I get it. Whenever I, I get kidney punched by God for something I said or did or thought, it doesn't seem like grace at the moment, but conviction of sin is grace. Forgiveness of sin is mercy. You see the difference? Forgiveness of sin is mercy. Punishment for sin is justice. All of those things are from God. And all of them are grace from God given to us. No different than the grace that allowed us to have the the physical injury, the physical capability to go out and work. Do you know that God's grace through conviction is this thing called sin? And God's mercy for his forgiveness of that personal sin is his mercy. He gives us mercy. He gives us grace. Yes, He has changed your life or He is in the process of changing your life, one or the other. You must choose. Or no, if you answer no to that, then then you will too someday stand in judgment. If you say no to God's grace, His mercy, His conviction is just, then you'll stand before Him in His justice. So know that repentance is, is God's desire for us today, but if you will not receive it, you will have justice. Hell will be filled. Hear this quote and, and hear it from a heart that, that's broken by it. Hell will be filled with a lot of people better than you. Did you hear that? Hell will be filled with a lot of people better than us. Even those of us that just gave a weekend or those that go on mission or they go, those that do and serve and give their entire life. Hell will be filled with people like that that have not repented and have not been convicted of sin, and convinced of their need for a Savior. That should bring us to the point of understanding that God calls for repentance. When you feel godly conviction, it's His loving grace poured down on you. As a matter of fact, the definition of repentance is this. I'm going to give you three points to it. Biblical definition of repentance is a transformation of nature. It is a definitive turning from evil, a turning from evil. And it is a turning to God in total obedience. That is your biblical definition of repentance, and it is God's grace that He gives it to us. By now, you should understand what sin is. We've been talking about it for six weeks. Some of you are probably done with that, saying, let's move on. This is not about sin. This is about repentance. This is the other side of that great coin. You you should understand what sin is according to God's Bible. If you don't, I'm going to read you the verse again that clearly defines it. Mark chapter 12, verse 30. 
It shows the disobedience and it sums it up in a very short sentence. Verse, Mark chapter 20, verse 30. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. If you are doing this perfectly, you're sinless. Anybody want to raise their hand and stand up and give a testimony about that perfection? I thought not. Then, the other side is we are guilty of not doing this. You have not loved the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You haven't loved your neighbor as yourself. Then, guilty is the decision on top of us. Do you feel conviction of the Holy Spirit? I'm going to ask you some questions and then try to answer them for us. Do you feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit? Does this sin, does this, this conviction drive you to the Savior? Or does it drive you from the Savior? Are you drawn to repentance and restoration or does it cause you to, to run from that feeling of conviction, that kidney punch? Which is it? If you can sin and not feel conviction, you feel no shame, you feel no regret, you feel nothing from being at war with God, being His enemy, if you feel nothing from that, let me caution you that you are probably, so, you're probably lost. You're probably in your sin. You're probably in trouble. There should be warning lights going off on the dash like we talked about a few weeks ago. If you feel no conviction over sin, and I mean sin daily, not just the sin of your past, as your youth that you never repented of, I mean sin daily. Christian, if you don't feel conviction over the ways that you break God's law daily, there's a problem in your life. Don't patch it over with, when I go to church on Sunday, or I was baptized you know, once or twice or three times, it is that relationship that has changed you, which was the definition of repentance. Let me tell you that the most difficult and loving thing I could tell you, the most difficult and loving thing I could tell you is the truth. You must repent, and repentance will change you. If there's not been a change, there's probably never been repentance. Because it's a new nature that God gives you. Does this concern you? It should. If it doesn't concern you for yourself, does it concern you for your loved one, for your son, for your daughter, for your husband, for your wife, for your aunt, your uncle, for your neighbor, down the street, your co-worker? Are you concerned by this great issue of repentance and sin and justification? If you say no, then I can definitively tell you you're lost. If you are not concerned, 100% you're lost. Because as a good Evangelist Ray Comfort says, if you're not concerned about your neighbor's salvation, I'm concerned about yours. There has to be concern for us as a Christian about our neighbors, about our own family. If you say, yes, this concerns me, then there's still hope. I say, yes, this concerns me. There's still hope for me. There's still hope for me to be sanctified, to be growing in my Christ-likeness, to desire to, to reach the lost around me. And when I fail... I repent. I don't hide from God. I don't say, okay, I've got to go sit and time out for a little bit. This is what we tend to do with our kids, right? When they mess up, when they disobey us, like, you go sit over there in the corner five minutes. After you've paid your penance, come back and we'll talk. We don't do this with God. We repent automatically. And he says, yes, come back. Come into my fellowship. I desire to use you. I desire to, to have you in the service. Not, not i got to wander for 20 or 30 years off in the wilderness until... Finally, I feel good enough to come back to church or to come back to the Lord. It is repentance through Him alone, not through our works. Will you hear today the Holy Spirit's conviction? Will you listen? Because we can hear and we can listen. There's a difference. Will it change you? Will you repent? Repentance is mandatory. You can't, you can't have Christ without repentance. You can't have heaven without a change of nature. Repentance is mandatory. I, I need you to remember, repentance is a complete change in your life. It's a change of your heart, your mind, your actions, your strength. All of those things take place in that Mark chapter 10 verse. It's a change of you, a new nature. Repentance is recognized that our sin is offensive to a holy God. If you see your sin as being really not that big a deal because everybody else does it, you don't understand sin. Your personal sin. Repentance. Repentance means that you make an about face, a military term, an about face to turn the other direction, to face God, to walk towards God, to live by His rule. 
Will you hear this? There are some uh, definite reasons why, why people will not hear these words. There are, there are real legitimate reasons why when I talk to people or when you talk to people about this, they, they shut you down, they turn you off, they ignore you later, don't answer your calls, act like they're not home, pull the shades down when you knock on their door. There's legitimate reasons. They don't like being told they're wrong. They don't like being told they're in desperate need of forgiveness because that implies something. What does it imply? That they've made a mistake, that they're wrong. If you need forgiveness of something, it means you've done something wrong, and people don't really like to hear that much. So is the loving thing just to let it go and not tell them? No. The loving thing is to be willing to put your capital, put the the social capital, the friendship that you have on the line and say, I love you enough to tell you this. See, there's reasons why they would not want to hear this. The second one is they don't want to change. They love their sin. They love their sin. You guys, the lost world loves their sin. Church, do you love your sin? Because you love what you serve. Are you serving self? Are you serving Savior? It will be proof in your life. Don't say, well, I just messed up. It was Saturday night. It was a rough time. That's one time deal. But it looks like every Saturday. You serve the thing you love most. Are you serving your Savior? Because there's a danger here. There's a real danger. See, the danger is you, you hear this, that is from the Holy Spirit right now, not from the preacher. You hear this, and there's this little conviction in your, in your conscience. There's a conviction that you feel, and you just kind of push it aside. You say, I'll deal with that later. I know it's a concern. I understand that preacher. I understand that Holy Spirit. Thank you. I'll take care of this later. And so you just push it aside. Or another problem is that we just say, a little remorseful, I'm sorry. Like, I, I'm sorry. And then we move on to do the same thing again. See, remorse and repentance are two different things. Remorse, as we just read in that Second Corinthians passage, remorse leads to death. Repentance leads to life. Which have you experienced? Which are you in the process of experiencing right now? The difference between these are huge, so huge, in fact, that it's heaven and hell. You can come to church. You can be remorseful, meaning... Sorry, but I'm going to do it again. You know that old saying, sorry, not sorry? That's remorse. That's I got caught, and I don't like the consequences. Sorry, honey, cheated. Sorry, boss, I stole. Sorry, policeman, I was speeding. Then go do the very same thing again. That's just remorse. It's not repentance. Repentance would be a change. You don't like the bad feelings or the consequences, so you feel bad for a little while. But really what it is, it's not that you hate the sin, it's that you hate getting caught. Amen? That, that's me speaking. That's what happens to me in my life. It's not that I hate the sin sometimes, it's that I hate being caught. We should reverse the rule. We must hate the sin or we'll take no actions against it. See, there's no real change in your actions, just a, it's just a continual thing. There's no change in your character, so it's remorse, not repentance. Repentance is this, it's the admission of guilt. Not, not that I was caught, so I have to say I'm sorry, mom, dad, husband, wife, I got caught. No, it's an admission of guilt, first to God and then to those you've offended. An admission means it hasn't been discovered yet, but you are broken by it, and so you admit it. It's a humbling, and it's a brokenness. There is no repentance without a humbling and without a brokenness. Remorse can be done without either of those. I, I'm... I used to be really good at saying I'm sorry and meaning none of it. <laughs> Ask my brothers and sisters. My kids are pretty good at that as well. How are yours doing? Your kids pretty good at that saying I'm sorry but not meaning it? Like I'm gonna, I'm, I'm going to say this but I don't really mean it. And everyone knows you don't mean it. Repentance, remorse, they're two different sides. It's a forsaking of sin, repentance is. It's a hatred of the sin that you once loved. It's a godly sorrow. A godly sorrow means, you know what, I've offended my neighbor, I've offended people by my sin, but more than that, I've offended God. And when you realize that you have offended God and God first and alone, you will repent. Or you'll be judged. And the choice is yours. Remorse, remorse left by itself will lead to fear, depression, anxiety, 
And in the very end, suicide. Because remorse doesn't fix the problem. It just puts a little Band-Aid over, a little, a little Tylenol, but you really got a much deeper issue in your head. Only repentance can do it. The verse 10 is our, is our main verse. Would you look at that again with me in 2 Corinthians verse 10? It says, For godly sorrow produces repentance. I am sorrowful that I offended a living God. Godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but, here's that word, but, but the sorrow of the world produces death. If you're just sorry for your sin, but you're unwilling to repent, it produces death, not life. Repentance is your brokenness over that sin. It leads you to salvation. Remorse is just feeling guilty. True repentance feels the pain and the shame of your sin. You feel it. You feel it often and daily when you sin. You feel the remorse, the shame of it, because it caused Christ pain. Not because of the pain you feel. That's remorse. And this guilt will lead you through repentance. You have to go through repentance to get to, you have to go through remorse to get to repentance. But if you stop short, there's an eternity difference between those two things. You will feel remorse, but it will lead you to repentance, which is that God-honoring change. Why are so many people um, who feel bad about their sin never getting to it? You ever wondered that? Why so many people will willingly remorse, show remorse over, show sorry, but they won't repent? It's because they just continue to revolve around this issue of remorse. They just keep kind of bouncing off the same problems and they keep saying, I'm sorry, but they never really change. So repentance was never gained, never asked for, never, never desired, and never worked towards. Just remorse, and it continues to get worse and worse and worse. So people say, well, I, I didn't get caught. It's legal, so it must not be any big deal. Now, I know the preacher said something about it in the Scripture, meaning that's not a good idea, like a whole Romans chapter 1 thing. Have you read that recently? But it's legal, so it must be okay for me. Or my conscience does not affect me. I don't feel it, so it must be okay for me to do. I meet people like this all the time. So they say, it's not a sin for me. When Scripture clearly says it is. You just aren't reading it properly. They're not feeling it. Biblically, they say God has no problem with it (laughs) because they don't know the God that has a problem with it. Repentance is so much more than a verbal acknowledgement of wrongdoing. It's not remorse. It is a God-given change, a stopping the sin. You won't stop at remorse. You won't stop for just a bad feeling. You must be changed forever. It must lead you to salvation. You should cry out, Father, forgive me for I've sinned against you, and you only have I sinned. If you're unwilling to do that, you're unwilling to repent. If you're unwilling to humble yourself in that way, then you're just going to continue to bounce around in remorse. You'll feel bad, you'll get over it. You'll feel bad, and you'll get over it. But you'll never get through it. Through it leads to repentance. Have you repented? Do you understand what it is? Are you willing to do it even today? Because there's only two kinds of people in here this morning. It's not white. It's not black. It's not male. It's not female. It's lost and it's saved. There are two types of people and you will leave this place either choosing remorse. I felt bad about that. Man, the preacher kicked me around a little bit this morning or repentance. I was humble. I was broken. The question is yours today. What will you do? with the gospel? What will you do with what the Holy Spirit is asking you to do? We're going to have a moment of invitation right now. I want to explain to you what this is. This is not some just kind of weird time that we do to make everyone feel awkward. This is an opportunity in God's house to do work with Him, to do business. If He is convicting you of something, speak to Him about it. You can do it at your, at your seat. You can do it with another friend. You can do it at the altar. But I encourage you, repentance, seek it and find it. Do not stop until you arrive at true godly repentance, which is only the forsaking of your sin. Would you pray with me for a moment? Fathers, we've come to this part in our service, in your day, in your time, where I pray that we are softened in, in listening where there's nothing in our 
mind that is distracting us, Lord, we have our relationship focused on you. Father, I pray that whatever it is, whatever the need in our heart, that it would be met with you only. Father, that your Holy Spirit would be convicting us and would be leading us to repentance, whether repentance unto salvation or repentance through sanctification. Father, I pray that we desire holiness, that we desire to live according to your perfect word, the inerrant scripture, and Lord, that that daily would make us look more like you. Father, where we do not peel that away. Father, for where we have sinned and either never been caught or are often caught, Lord, I pray we would repent of that today and forsake it. Lord, allow us to see how it hurts you. Father, how it causes you great shame for a child of yours or a creation of yours to sin willfully. Lord, I pray this morning that there would be a humbling. I pray this morning that your spirit would be challenging and changing each of us in here this morning, that we would not leave the same we came. Father, it is for your glory and for your name we ask these things. And we say amen. Would you stand with me for a few moments? Mm -hmm.